We've talked about <clears throat> what it means to see life through God's eyes. Remember, we've talked about having a clear picture of who God is, the holiness and the righteousness of God. When we understand who He is, it helps us to, to move forward. We talked about who we are and, and who are we that people, that, that God is mindful. We've looked at who uh, the Holy Spirit is. We've looked at who Jesus is. And so you put all of that together, what's the missing piece? Of course, we could talk about the Word, and I'm, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do that in a separate series where we talk about the foundation of the Bible and, and how all of that works. But what's the missing piece to this whole picture? We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're looking forward, and what are we? The body of Christ, the church. All of that exists, and God has put all of that together so that we, the church, can do the things that He has established. And so I titled this sermon, That Church. How many of you all have ever wanted to be a member of that church? You know that church that seems to be doing everything awesome? That church that just for whatever reason attracts and does? That church. Well, here's the thing about it. That church is not always what it's cracked up to be. Um, I want to be part of that church, but what do I mean by that? That means different things to different people. And so I'm not knocking churches or ministries. I'm not. Um, but as you all just witnessed, we have okay music. We don't have quality sound and light. We don't, right? But we have okay music, don't we? And the more you all sing, the better it gets. So you all sing and it's rocking for Jesus awesome, right? The rest of the time, it's just me and the three. So there we are. But that's okay. That church is okay. Um, and so when you look about it and you think about it, what do we mean by I want to be a part of that church? Well, I want to go back into the New Testament because I think if you want to know what the church is supposed to be, where do you go? You go to the beginning, into the Scripture. What does the Scriptures tell us about what that church is? And so here's an here, here's a, a interesting thing. I'm in Acts chapter 11. I didn't start at the beginning. And in the beginning part of, of Acts, when the church was formed after the day of Pentecost, and there's all those amazing passages about how they did everything in common and they sold their stuff and they were sharing and they were taking care and they fellowshiped and they worshiped. That's what the church was doing. But as that expanded and went out, the church spread out into different areas. And it's interesting when we think about that church and say, I want to be like a New Testament church. That's what I want to be. Well, let's think about it for a moment. The church in Corinth was a New Testament church. And the church in Corinth was messed up. In fact, it was messed up so bad that Paul wrote two letters that we have and possibly a third that we don't have. Just to try to deal with all of the junk that's going on in the church at Corinth. Divisions and all kinds of weird beliefs. And we think about, I want to be a New Testament church. Well, I don't want to be the church at Corinth. I don't want to be like that, do you? And then you can go and think about the seven churches that are listed in the first two chapters of the book of Revelation, the seven churches of Asia. Excellent churches. We've got a letter to the Ephesians that was written by Paul to the church in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus was an awesome church. And Jesus said, hey, you all are doing good. And in that list, he's talking about New Testament churches. What does he say about the church in Ephesus? I have nothing against you, really. You're, you, 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 you're spot on with your teaching. You don't let false doctrine in. But you've left your first love. I don't want to be that church, do you? That gets everything on the outside right, but misses what's on the inside? And we, and we leave the main thing? I don't want to be that church. And so when we think about it, there's one church in Scripture in the New Testament that I've always been fascinated with. And I go back and I look at it. And I think if I could be a part of any New Testament church, where would I want to be? I want to be in that church. I want to look like that church. I want to function like that church. Where is that church? It's the church in Antioch. So that's what we're going to be looking at. That church. The church in Antioch today. Why are we talking about it? Because I want us in Kenyon to understand who we are. Why we're here. And what God's picture of this church is. What are we to do? So if you have your Bibles open... Acts chapter 11, I'm going to read verses 19 through 30. Now those that were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came, who on coming into Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. If you'll allow me to pause just a moment, I want to explain what this is about. 
After Stephen was stoned, there was such um, pressure on the church that they, wouldn't, they hadn't left Jerusalem, and now they scattered, and they went everywhere. And that's what it's talking about. After the persecution of Stephen, the church went pew. But think back, God, Jesus had told them to go, right, into all of the world, and they weren't going yet. So now they were, and they were going. And it says that they were going everywhere, but they were only speaking about the, the gospel of Jesus to the Jews. And when they got to Antioch, some of the men spoke to the Hellenist. Who is that? Greeks. Hellenists are the Greeks. So Gentiles. I just want that to be clear so the rest of it makes sense. They were also preaching the Lord Jesus. And, in the, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord who, with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Underline that. That's an important verse. In Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. That's interesting because you can go back into history, Roman history, and pinpoint exactly when the famine took place in the days of Claudius, historically. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. There's a lot more to the church of Antioch, but I've got some things I want us to look at. Why do I think they are that church? One of the reasons is because Antioch was a ridiculously hard place to have a church. It was considered to be the third greatest city in the known world in the Roman Empire. Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. It was a crossroads of trade. It was a metropolitan area. It was a cosmopolitan area. It was a wildly religious area, but it was also extremely pagan. Extremely pagan. It was corrupt. And this is the place where God established, isn't this amazing? The first mission organization to go out into all the world in this context that's where he said let's go see the first 18 verses talk about the conversion of cornelius and how the gentiles had begun coming in we talked about then then stephen is killed and and that's where we get up to so now then that we're looking at the church i got four things that i want to point out and this is not a three-point sermon this is a four-point sermon and it may be a six or eight before I get done. So I hope that there's no Super Bowl game, there's nothing happening, so we're just going to like be the family and hang out today, right? No. First, what is the most important thing that that church does? Whatever that church is, the church that God designed, the church that God wants us to be, what's the first and foremost important thing they do? Look at verses 19 and 20. They were scattered because of the persecution, right? They traveled, and it says, speaking the word. Speaking the word. The most important thing that we will do is share the word of God. A church that is not sharing the word of God is not a church. If we're not speaking and sharing and speaking to everybody wherever we go. Now here's an interesting thing that I want you to think about. When he says in this passage in verse 19, it's the word speaking the word to no one except Jews and then preaching and they spoke to the Hellenist, that word for speaking. We understand what that means, right? Speaking. Do we understand the context of that? I don't ever go into Greek because Greek is a lost dead language, but this was written in Greek and we kind of need to uh, occasionally. The word for speaking here connotates, get this, talking to people. Who knew that we should be Talking to people about Jesus. You see, the Greek word here says that we, normal believers, scattered, speak the word of God. This is what's fascinating. Antioch was evangelized not by the disciples. It wasn't evangelized by the apostles. 
But it was average people of the body of Christ that shared their faith where they were with the people they were with. They didn't preach as we understand preaching. They didn't stand behind the pulpit and, and, and speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were behind their work counters. They were behind the places in the market where people were. They were in their shops. They were at lunch with friends. They were wherever they were in social gatherings, going about their everyday life. They are the ones, we are the ones, speaking the Word of God wherever we are that evangelize, not the church. Now let me ask you this. You understand that the church is all of us, right? The body of Christ? We know that it's, it's elementary, it's not the building. When we say we're going to church, what do we mean by that? Usually it means we're going to a specific location in a specific building, right? Is this the building? Is this the church? Well, this is the place the church meets. The church actually is you. You are the church. I am the church. This is just where we gather because the wind blows a lot here. And we need a place inside to gather. You see, the body of believers do the work of the kingdom. And what made Antioch so important was that they didn't just have their preacher preaching. They didn't just have the disciples or the apostles preaching. It wasn't, hey, everybody come to the house and we're going to let you listen to our pastor. That doesn't work. That's not why Antioch exploded and became the central hub of the world missions. You know why it did? Because the body of believers in the church in Antioch spoke the Word of God. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. Exactly. I'm just a regular old disciple. Exactly. That's who it was. Who has the most impact when it comes to speaking the Word? The preacher or you? You. Because you live life with people. So if we want to be that church, it means that we're a church that shares the Word of God. Both on Sunday and Wednesday when we're teaching. But every day as we go forward, we're sharing the Word of God. How many of you all have had somebody at some point in your life speak the Word of God into you that had nothing to do with being at church? Maybe it was on the job. Maybe it was at the, at the gas station. Life happens, doesn't it? Why the church in Antioch is that church is because they took serious their commission of the Lord to speak the truth, to speak the Word of God. Now, also in that, we have to know the Word of God to speak the Word of God, right? Do we have to know the Word of God if we're going to speak the Word of God? So yes, this is your Sunday dose of read your Bible. Every week you get that. Why? Because the most important tool we have is the Word of God. The Word of God that we can talk, that we can work. It seems that they um, kind of stopped in this interesting thing, and we're only talking to the Jews. That's what they were doing. And we, I want to talk about that for just a moment. They shared the Word of God. And here's something that I want to make of this, and I don't want to make too much of it. Sometimes we're really good at sharing the Word of God with people that we're comfortable with. Right? We're, we're really good about sharing our faith with people like us. I mean, how many of y'all, when you're somewhere and you find a believer, somehow or another you figure out, hey, this guy that I don't know, he's a Christian. And now we'll have the conversation. Now we start talking, right? I'm comfortable talking to you once I found out that you're a believer. But do we share it with people that we're not comfortable with? Do, are, are we willing to speak the truth and in, in, in the Word of God with people that aren't like us? That aren't like us. Now here's what happens. I'm glad we're doing this today, but now I'm messed up. I've got to walk somewhere. I'm going to pick something just bizarrely weird, so I'm not picking on any particular cultural group. This is just how I want to put this in play. There's some places that we love to go in Colorado. I love Colorado because that's where God, he, he made it first and the rest he just kind of went. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There's some, there's some particular places that I love to go in Colorado that are um, interesting little towns with fascinating people. Man, fascinating people that like love Mother Earth and, and crystals, whatever those are, not the meth kind, crystals. I don't know what those are. I don't know. 
And they, they like, I, if I had hair like that, though, I'd have dreadlocks, too. And they would be, like, really long. But they, they're those kind of people. And they're nothing like Canyon, Texas people, right? Their worldview's different, and everything's different. And we, let me ask you, have you ever been in those situations? And you're like, dude, I am like a duck way out of water here. I don't belong here. This is so bizarre. I don't know what to do here. Do you want what you do when you're in that situation? Speak Jesus. Because what our tendency is, is to run and hide and find somebody like us that now we're comfortable talking to. When it says they began talking to the Hellenists, this is Jews speaking to Greeks. That's just uncomfortable. It's just not what you do. This is a group of people that we don't have anything to do with particularly, but they began speaking the truth and the Gentiles began listening and they began accepting Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moved among them and they're all going, wow, wait a minute. The Word of God affects all people. It's good for everybody, even people not like us. That's the kind of church I want to be. The church that speaks the Word of God to people. People, regardless of whether they're like us or not, regardless of whether their worldview is like mine or not, even if it makes me uncomfortable, who more should I speak to? We have a tendency to have holy huddles and talk about Jesus among ourselves and high five, right? And then we go out and zip it up. We don't say nothing to nobody. That's not what the church in Antioch did. They gathered together, they prayed, they studied, they prepped, they got ready, and then they went out and they spoke the word of God. We won't be that church. That's what we do. We go out into the highways and the hedges, into the workplaces, in the community. We speak the word of God. We speak truth. We got a bunch of young folks here that are going to WT. WT is a microcosm of the world I'm talking about. It's real easy to huddle up with the people in your degree program that come from your background and do your thing and not say anything to anybody else, but... God forbid, we, we can't be that church because that church will never reach the world and have the impact that the church at Antioch had in the world. Speak the word. Second, this is, this is even more important to me, I think, even more, maybe even more than speaking the word. It says in, the, in verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believe turn to the Lord. It is important that we understand that we can speak whatever, but we have to have the hand of the Lord, the power of God in us. We have to be working in the power of the Lord. They were empowered by God to do the things that they did. It's understood that, that in their speaking, in their teaching, it's not because they were great orators. It's not because they were the most brilliant people. It's because the power of God was coming out through them. Have you ever started speaking to somebody and the Holy Spirit, who we talked about last week, all at once just dumped stuff in you that you, you didn't remember that you knew, and you said stuff that you're not exactly sure where that came from, but God was empowering you to speak the truth? In love, have you ever encountered somebody that you should not even want to speak to, but something just compelled you to do that? It's the empowerment, the power of God. How many of y'all think that without the power of God, we fail? That is an absolute truth. Without the power of God, we fail. The reason that they were so successful and were speaking the truth, but the hand of the Lord was on them. They were a small group of persecuted refugees who had run for their life from the city of Jerusalem. And they came to Antioch, and all at once we've got people speaking the truth, and the power of God is on them, and they're having an impact in this community, and the church is growing, and it's huge. Why? Because God empowers them. This is why I want to say this is important for us to understand. It doesn't matter how good we program stuff. It doesn't matter how slick the music is how awesome the children's ministry is, how amazing all of the facilities are. It doesn't matter how good the technology and the media is. If the power of God is not pushing it, it means nothing. Sometimes we get so caught up in if we just had this, like that church. If only we had like that church, then we could do something. You know what we're doing? We're not counting on the Word of God and counting on on the capacity of man to make stuff happen. And that's all bad. The church at Antioch trusted in the power of God. They didn't have all the skills. They didn't have all the stuff. They were just a group of people that loved Jesus and they shared the gospel and God empowered them. I 
this is a historical fact. The Nicene Cre Council took place in A.D. 325. Okay? This is happening um, within the first few years of the first century, the, the letter. And, and this is what it says. There's reports from the Nicene Council in A.D. 325 that there were more than 200,000 Christians in Antioch by 325 A.D. from a small group of refugees that came into the town and began speaking Jesus. By 325 A.D., 200,000. It's reported historically. That's nearly a fourth of the entire population of the city of Antioch that had become believers. Was it because they had great evangelists? No. It's because they had people empowered by the Lord to speak the Word of God every day in their lives. I want us to be that church, don't you? I want us to be that church. It would be really awesome if we had a really cool big building and the lights and sound and all the cool stuff. That would be awesome for a minute and then I'd get bored with it. Especially if we weren't reaching people for Jesus Christ. I would rather us meet in a barn with no heat if we're reaching people and speaking the truth. How about you? That's the church that I desire to be. They grew because the power of God was on them. Let me, let me remind us again, nothing that we do at Canyon Country Church will amount to anything of value if God is not the power behind it. If God's not the one with his hand on it. If it's not because God has laid it on our heart and is empowering us and gifting us and, and giving us what we need, it will not happen. And in your personal life, as a believer, unless God is empowering you, you will not make it. Is that true? I have to have the power of God in my life every day. Every day. They were empowered. But there's even something else more amazing to me in verses 22 through 26. Let's read that. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. What? That Gentiles are getting saved. Oh, no. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, because he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit of faith. And great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Let's back up. Who's Saul? Saul, that guy that was persecuting the church and putting people to death, the one that was standing there when Stephen was killed that started this whole mess. And he goes and finds Saul. And he brought him to Antioch. But in that first passage, there's something that we often miss. That church recognizes the God's grace is amazing. They recognized that God's grace is truly amazing. What does that mean? They recognized that the grace of God was over the Gentile world too. It's not just about us. It's about all people. And God extended grace and salvation to them. And the church that gets it, that church operates under grace. Now we like the verse, for we are saved by what? Grace through grace faith right we know that and we love it and we like that we live under grace because now we don't have to live under the law i've got some folks in our church that are studying through the levitical law god bless you i'm grateful we live under grace but they understood it to mean that god is gracious to all people even those not like us they recognized the grace of god being poured out on the greeks and they were receiving the gospel and then they went and they found saul now listen, you might not see the grace in that, but like I said, Saul was a guy that had been killing them and putting them in jail and supposedly met Jesus. You ever had somebody that was an absolute rank straight uh, sinner out there, one of those really rough people that you're like, nye, nye, and then they get Jesus, right? They get Jesus, and what do we do? <laughs> yeah, right, they got Jesus. Well, see how much Jesus they really got. Most of the people were that way with Saul. Most everybody didn't want nothing to do. They didn't trust Saul. He said he got saved, right? Sure he got saved. He got saved, and then when he gets mad, he's going to kill you, put you in jail. Yeah, we don't believe that. This is our problem. We look at people with fleshly eyes, and we miss the grace of God that exists. 
We look at people and we don't give them the benefit of the doubt and we, do, we discount the grace of God. Who's the person that Barnabas went to get? The hated Saul. Why? Because he knew the grace of God. And he knew that Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul, was an am amazing teacher. He knew that Saul had been converted. And he was for sure converted. He extended grace. The church at Antioch extended grace. A church, that church, extends grace to all people. It means that we don't quickly come to judgment. It means that when people are repentant, we allow them to be repentant and move forward, not hold all of their past sins against them. We don't chain them to what God has freed them from. We don't hold people in that world. A church that looks at all people with hope and grace and recognizes that God transforms people. How many of you all here are transformed by the power of God? You are a transformed believer. Your life is totally different. If you had not encountered the grace of God, where would you be today? It's scary, isn't it? But I want to ask you this, and, and, and I'm not being self-serving as our church, but I want to be really honest. What if the church hadn't extended grace? When you walked in and said, hey, I found Jesus, and the people that knew you went, yeah, right. Do you want to be that church that turns people away and says, well, you've got to prove it to us. We don't trust you. Or do you want to be the church that says, for by grace you have been saved. And we extend grace. Now listen, sometimes do we get taken advantage of? Absolutely. Is that okay? Absolutely. I'd rather err on the side of grace than judgment, hadn't you? And the church at Antioch looked at all of these people and they said grace is real. And God changes people. And here's Saul. And we bring Saul and he teaches us for a year because the grace of God is amazing. May we never forget the grace of God that lands on all of us. It's real easy after you've been saved for a while and you get your life kind of going in the direction that you forget how amazing the grace of God really is. But the church at Antioch understood. They were not only empowered by God, but they, they understood and operated in the, the grace of God. He was working in the Gentiles. He was extending grace to all people. And then in the last section, verses 25 and 26, I want us to read that. So Barnabas went to, to Tarsus and looked for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met the church and taught a great many people. And, and in Antioch, the, the disciples were first called Christians. I wanted you to underline that, and I want to make a simple note of something. Up until this time... They were called all different kinds of things. Who are they? Those that are called out. Believers of Christ. It is at the church of Antioch that people began to identify them and call them Christians. That is big, isn't it? Because the people looking at the church in Antioch said there's something seriously different about this group of people. And forefront in their teaching and in their love is Jesus Christ, the redeemed, the one that they keep talking about. Wouldn't you love to be identified as Christians? To be called Christian? You say, well, yeah, that's dumb. No, it's not. Because in order to be called that, we must reflect that. Right? How many of y'all know folks that, that call themselves Christians but don't reflect that? And I'm going to be real ugly. There's churches that call themselves Christian, but they do not reflect that. Okay? Here, they were identified first by Christ. And they were first called Christians. But that's not the big thing I wanted to look at. This is the big thing I want to look at. Because those Christians, those that were called out, those that were named after Christ, that said, we are followers, we are disciples, we believe in, in Jesus Christ... They knew that meant something. And what that meant was, we go and we do. In the last section of this passage, it says, Now in these days, verse 27, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. 
So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So in the midst of all of this, I just want us to recap what makes it that church. Operating in grace, right? Empowered by, by God. Speaking and teaching his word. Extending grace to all people. Recognizing that God loves everybody, not just us. That's amazing stuff. But here's something really important. They shared together in the work of ministry. Agabus shows up and says, hey, there's a famine that's going to hit everywhere. Now, if I stood up today and I said, and you believe me, I said, the Lord has said there's going to be a famine. We're going to fall under a famine. What would we do? What would our response be? I'm going to be really honest. Probably most of us would go pretend it's a snow day and buy all the bread and milk. There's going to be a famine. I'm stockpiling, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to start counting my money. I'm going to put it back. I'm going to figure out it. I'm saving for that rainy day when the famine hits. And, and I don't know what we're going to do. I'm going to be immediately thinking about me and mine. True? Isn't that what we do? They didn't go out and buy a bunch of stuff to stockpile and hoard. What they do? They said, well, it's going to start over there. We need to the help over there. And they began sending money to help in the regions beyond where they were. This is an important part of being that church. That church is concerned about what God is doing everywhere, not just here. And we join together to be a part of what God is doing everywhere, not just here. Now, we do something here that I am so proud of our church, Canyon Country Church. If you were here for the board meeting when we had adopted the budget, you got to see the budget. In our budget, we have a missionary that we support every month. In our budget, for $300 a month, you say, that's not much. Yeah, but if there's enough of us doing that, then it helps, right? So this is what we do. We have Andrew Dawson. He works with um, Free International, going and pulling young men and women out of the sex trafficking thing and giving them hope in Jesus Christ and a way out. Is that worthwhile? Is that a, a, a famine of hope that's coming over our land? Yes. We send money to the Teague family in France, $300 a month. What are they doing? They are taking the gospel, speaking the word into the darkest place in Europe. Less than 1% are Christians. Is that a famine of hope? Yes. And we're sending so they can go. We send to the Montana Project. How many of y'all love Missoula, Montana? You ever been there? It's an awesome place. It needs Jesus. Really bad. It's beautiful, surrounded by beauty and wonder. But it needs Jesus. And we're sending money. You say, well, great, we'll send money. What does that mean? We're doing what they did. But a church that is that church is more concerned about our funding going out there to do the things in the world than it is here. You ask, why do we have these floors? These are painted floors that are cracked and full of stuff. I'm just going to be real honest. Why do we have these floors? Because we send money to France. And we send money to Montana. And we send money to every place we can find that God is doing something that we can afford to do. We send money. We could pay for new floors. Right? But there is a drought out there of hope and truth. And we would rather be investing in that, wouldn't you? Than new floors. So do you mind the cracked, dirty yellow floors? Why do we have mismatched pews? Because they were cheap. <laughs> they're, un, they're, they're unhandy, right? They, I mean, every Sunday morning, there's somebody comes in here and lines them up because y'all won't sit still for church. And when it gets up, it's just like they're all over the place. They're scattered everywhere. Why do we put up with that? Why don't we buy new nice chairs and fix things? Because there's stuff happening out there that has eternal consequence and what we said on doesn't. Now someday we are going to get new chairs, I promise. But how many of y'all would rather put up with these mismatched goofy pews and send our help to France where less than 1% of the population knows Jesus Christ. 
But we can do something about that. So why did we quit cooking supper on Wednesday night? Because we take that money and we are buying. You know what it costs to send Operation Christmas Child boxes? It's gone to $9 a box to ship them. But I don't know about you, but I can cook supper at home and, or grab a sandwich if we can save that money so that we can send boxes around the world that have the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. How about you? Which makes sense to you? How come everybody's bringing peanut butter here? Because there's kids that need food. And we can help with that. Do you understand why we do what we do? I hope you see it's because our church is trying to be that church that's more concerned about the world around us and their need for Jesus Christ than what we have here. Yeah, we don't have the greatest of everything, but we've got good stuff, right? These, how many of y'all have ever had a pew fold up with you? <laughs> Yet. <laughs> we'll start looking at, church, or at chairs when that happens. You see... If we want to be that church, we have to be focused looking outside. Always looking outside and not so much inside. Because that church was concerned about those that were lost, not those that had been found. We're found. Now you may be here today and be a lost, but you're here and you can be found today. Jesus Christ can reach out to right now. And transform your life. But I want us to be that church. The disciples determined among themselves that everybody would give according to his ability. That's an underlined statement. You say, man, I ain't hardly got enough money to pay my own bills. I know. But you can put what you can when our heart says, let's do something for the Lord according to their ability. It's not about the big number check you write. It's about the willingness to give. So that the gospel can go where it needs to go. And it's about us doing together. It's like I said, if, if all of those mission teams are depending on our $300 a month to live, it ain't happening for them, sorry. But enough churches and enough individuals and enough families have that same burden that we pull our resources together, which is why we belong to a denomination so we can do more together than we can on our own. And we connect with each other and we fund mission projects around the world that we would never get to do on our own, right? And that's what they did. They joined together and they sold what they had. They gave what they could and they sent it. Not to take care of themselves, but to those with great need. That church is always looking out instead of in. When the church begins to focus on the inward side of we, us, and I, it begins to rot inside. It becomes so concerned with we want, we don't have, I want, I don't like, that it implodes from the middle. But when a church is constantly looking to the outside of what we can do out there, who can we reach? Where can we go? What can we do? How can we help? We never have time to focus on the I because we're focusing on the them. And we understand when He said go and make disciples, He didn't mean just in our town, but to go. And as you are going, and as you are speaking, speak the Word. So let's... Look at that church. What do they do first? They speak the Word of God. If you want to be part of that church, we've got to start speaking the Word of God. Maybe you are. Bless you. If not, let's ramp it up. You can speak the Word of God. True? You have the ability? Unless you can't talk. And then you can write signs. A church, that church, speaks the truth. That church understands that their power comes from God, not because they're, they're special. Not because we're gifted and talented. It's the empowerment of God on us that makes it work, right? It's God working through us. And we recognize that grace extends. Isn't that amazing? I'm grateful for grace. If it hadn't been for grace, I would be dead now. And we operate in grace. We give people the benefit of the doubt. And we extend grace. Because by grace, we're transformed. And we share. We care. We look outside at a world that is lost and going to hell without Jesus Christ. And we say, how can we help? I love this church. 
I've been in church my entire life. The first Sunday I was alive, my dad and mom took me to church. And I've been in church pretty much every Sunday except a few rebellious ones all of my life. I've been part of many churches. Some really good churches. Some really not good churches. I've been in churches... I've been part of churches that were so inward focused that they didn't even want anybody new to come because they might sit in their pew. I stood up one time to preach at a church. It wasn't mine, but I went to preach at this church because the pastor wanted a day off. And I go, this is a true statement. I standing on the porch. Deacon comes out. He says, are you the preacher today? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, I want to tell you something. We're small and we like it this way. Don't mess with it. I messed with it. Because that's not God's church, is it? That's not how the kingdom works, is it? So I've been in all kinds of churches. But do you know what fascinates me about this church more than anything? We're that church. We're that church that loves everybody, regardless of what you do or where you come from or what your history is. I don't care. We don't care. We extend grace. How many of you all here are all from the same place in the same worldview. It's what I thought. Nobody. But we're here. This church loves people. This church puts up with this. And it's not bad, right? But it's not like, you don't walk in here and go, whoa, this is cool. We walk in and go, hey, this is a barn. But we love it because God's given it to us to do something out there, not here. This is just where we come gather tools, right? This is where we store the stuff so that we can go out there and do it. This church understands that it's more about the people than the place. We had a horse named Johnny Rotten in this church giving pony rides around the pews and doing what horses do on the floor. And you know who got upset about it? Nobody. Isn't that awesome? Nobody got upset about it. Because this is just a place where the church comes to do ministry. And we love people. We also understand that we're really not that good at what we do. We're not really that great, but God empowers us, and it's the power of God that works through us and makes stuff happen. Um, there's certain chords that we don't sing in, and we, we sing songs in wrong, hard chords. Do you know why? Because I can't play the other ones. So you just got to sing real low. But it's the power of God when we begin to sing, isn't it? It's the power of God that moves within us. I could go on and on about how much I love this church. How amazing this church is. All the different pieces that make this church that church. But I also know that if we don't continually focus on being that church, we will lose it and become the inward focused church that a few years, 30 years after Paul writes about how awesome they are, the Lord says, but you've left your first love. If we don't continually focus out and focus on the power of God and focus on the Word of God, make that what we're about, not all the programs and all the junk we do. If those things are in place and we understand it is God working through us that transforms lives, we can continue to be that church. But when we get selfish and we get upset and we stop extending grace and we don't like this and we don't like that, we will cease and we'll become the church. that implodes and the power of God moves away from. I don't want to be that church. So let's be encouraged today. Are we like the church of Antioch? We are. Do we need to ramp it up? Absolutely. That's the church that God has called. That's the church that Jesus told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That church can go to that world and transform it for Jesus Christ by the power of God. Guys, I'm excited today to be the pastor of that church.
Y'all are awesome. Let's not let our heads get big and say, great, we've, we've arrived. No. Because for everybody that's here that has found the grace and the love of Jesus Christ, there are multitudes out there that do not know that God loves them. And you work with them. You shop with them. You live with them. Speak and be that church. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, and it is an amazing day to be gathered with the church. And Lord, we are excited about the possibilities of what you desire to do with us. But God, I also know that we can just as easily become the church that becomes self-centered and inward-focused and forgets the purpose and the power and the reason. And we become that church that's left our first love God forbid. So I I ask you, Lord, today, as we're gathered here, everybody here is at a different place. Some are maturing believers that have been at this a long time and recognizing it, and I'm grateful for that. And some are just baby believers that don't even know the the basics yet, but they're working and growing. I am so grateful for that. That's why you had Paul and Barnabas teaching. And Lord, there may be some here that are just seeking and hoping that there's really truth. That God really does love them. And that God really does care. And that God really can transform their life. Wherever we are today, God, let me say, we are blessed first to be in your presence. We are blessed, Lord, that we can come before you and gather as the church. But God, I pray today that you will compel in our hearts to take the church where you said to go. To Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And be that church. Thank you for meeting our needs and giving us resources. God, may we use them for your glory and your kingdom. God, may we not look at the negative things around us, but see the positives that you're doing because Canyon Country Church is here. May we focus on what you're doing globally and locally and get engaged and rejoice that we get to be part of that church. God, lift us up and encourage us today. We are blessed among people to be a part of that church. We love you. We thank you today. So if there's one here today, Lord, that is not yet part, but their heart is drawing with the Holy Spirit surround them. And I want to encourage you, if that's you today, to reach out and trust the Lord and say, I don't know what all it means, but I want to be part of that. And I believe that Jesus Christ can change my life. Would, that, would you do that today? Or maybe you're a believer that's been here a while and you just got bored and you're sitting on your hands and you see all the negative around us. Well, let's stop and ask God to transform our view to see what He's doing out there, not in us. And let's be a part of it. Lord, I pray, above all else, at the end of the day, that Canyon Country Church is that church that brings glory and honor to you and hope to the world that is lost. Pour your blessing on us. Empower us through your spirit. And may we be excited today to be a part of that church. In Jesus' name, amen.